Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune, and we're here to talk some Oklahoma football and recruiting for you guys. The five and four Oklahoma Sooners head to Morgantown this week. Parker and I head out tonight uh, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then we'll be up in the morning to head down for our hour and 15 minute drive to Morgantown. Yay. Can't wait. Um, Parker, we want to start with Morgantown and the expectations or the lack of expectations or what the heck do we think is going to happen? Can Oklahoma be five and five? Can they be six and four? Or do we want to dive right into the bad news first? Which is recruiting. I'm just going to be honest. Yeah, I was going to say, there's there, there's been a lot of bad news this week. And it's not <laughs> exclusive to recruiting either. I mean, basketball season started with the opposite of a bang. That was a thing. Um. Obviously, that was pretty frustrating to watch. I'm not gonna lie. Like, how do you have Sheffield, the Groves brothers, uh, Jalen Hill, and uh, who's the other? Uh, ba- how do you say? Ba- how do you say the last Bamisil. name? Benasil, yeah. And the, uh, honestly, Sheffield and Benasil, they're freaking two fun, phenomenal offensive guys. I text you afterwards. I, it, it's hard for me to watch Tanner Grove sometimes. Like it is hard to watch Tanner. But no, I, I, I would say going back to your original question, I would say let's just talk about the bad news first because we talked about it on the live stream Wednesday. I understand that there are plenty of people that only listen to the podcast and don't watch the live stream. So for those folks, I think it. Uh, it makes sense to kind of rehash everything that happened over the first few days of this week. Yeah. um, If you didn't know, 2023 four-star defensive end, Austin native, daddy played at Austin, Texas University, has now, Colton Vasek has now flipped to University of Texas. If that's news to you, I'm sorry that we had to tell you, but it happened. I'm sorry. If it is news to you, you have not been paying attention for the last month anyway. So, I mean, this thing, like, it, it started out with an innocent little Alabama's playing. I went and watched, which at the time, you know what, that I that was still – for as long as he stayed committed, that's that that part of the whole thing was believable. Oklahoma was the hot team at the time. They were three and zero. He wasn't going in because I went and saw him even afterwards, and he's like, "Dude, I'm 100 percent Oklahoma. I'm not going anywhere." And I didn't put a mic up to the kid or nothing. And this kid would call me and tell me things that were going on. And sure enough, as at Parker as the 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 month went on, our communication started slowing down a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And that's where we kind of got the idea of, okay, something's up. And then when he visited Texas last week on a Tuesday and didn't come for the OU Baylor game, like he had told everybody in the world, I'm visiting for OU Baylor. I'm going to visit Oklahoma for OU Baylor. When that happened, and then he says he's coming on Bedlam instead, you kind of knew that visit wasn't ever going to happen. And it's only a matter of when, not if, he's flipping to the University of Texas. And it has a lot to do with what went on behind the scenes. Now, if I, I will go to my grave believing if the kid, the kid himself – Chose Oklahoma in late July, early August. He committed on August 1st. He committed publicly August 1st, excuse me. He committed to Oklahoma in July. And then he came up and reaffirmed it at the party in the palace. And he made that conscious decision to commit. Everybody was on board, according to sources, except for one person in the family. 
And of course, that person being the one that played it at the University of Texas. And that's understandable. People have to understand, like, his dad was getting bombarded by donors in a raucous way. And I know Parker, I said something along the lines of, uh, during the YouTube live of the irony in all of this is the fact that Arch Manning, senior Arch Manning grandpa, took one for the team when Peyton committed to Tennessee, knowing that if you live in New Orleans and you don't go to LSU or Ole Miss, and especially when you're Arch Manning, you don't, your kid doesn't go to Ole Miss, that's like the biggest treason of all time. And it, they were, and he stuck by Peyton and defended Peyton and, and took all the lumps for Peyton. And yet you have Arch on the flip side, Arch grandkid, number one quarterback in the country, air quote, number one quarterback in the country. Um, Cause we all, we both think Jackson Arnold is the best quarterback in the country in 2023. And it's not, we, I would think that if he wasn't going to Oklahoma, honestly, just because of what I've seen, the kid's phenomenal. He plays the toughest competition week in and week out, blah, blah, blah. But you watch that, and then on the flip side, the irony in the whole deal is that Arch Manning is trying to tell, and successfully did so, Colton, you've got to stay home. Like, why would you want to leave home? Like, why would you not want to go to Texas? I didn't go to Old Miss. My family assumed, everybody assumed I was going to Old Miss the whole time until... Georgia and Alabama became big players and then Texas, but the kid grew up loving Texas. You can see pictures back in the day. It was, it was, there was all sorts of dynamics there. His dad grabbed, Arch's dad graduated from Ole Miss, played at Ole Miss as a freshman until he had the spinal uh, issue that cost him and he had to learn how to walk again, Cooper. Um, There were so many, ironic things in this whole thing and then you got <laughs> the mom that's just like neutral like just want my boy to be happy like when i talk to her just want my boy to be happy i'm gonna cheer for him if he's in crimson or you know burn orange doesn't matter and it, it she it was believable with her because she was she was telling the truth she really didn't care she was she loved coach chavis and coach venables and coach Bates. like loved them and then you have colton who loved oklahoma was good friends with several kids in the class. And all of a sudden, things, the last two and a half weeks, just seemed like it was all Texas. And it got to the point where he just shut off media. And the text that he sent me was super nice. Like, hey, you're my favorite media person. And I wasn't, we weren't really talking at the time. I you and I, I've since sent you, you've seen the screenshots of it. It's just, it was a, he was super polite out. He was like, Hey man, I'm not doing interviews anymore because everybody's bombarding me. And it had to do with an on three site that went there and kind of cornered the kid and put out a bunch of stuff and made him say things that he didn't want to say publicly and do this and that. And it just came off bad so I get a text message the very next day from him. Hey, I know you're coming down, but I'm not going to do interviews. And I said, is there something I did? And he said, no, you've been great. He was even polite enough before he announced to text me and thank me. Like he didn't, and I mean, that he's a good kid. And I know you fans are going to hate on him, but he's a good kid. Uh, you haven't got really got to know him, Parker, but you've been a, you've been a part of recruiting processes like that where you still talk to a kid that's going someplace else other than Oklahoma because of the relationship you built with the kid throughout that process. And um, sometimes fans can be a little unrelenting. Yeah. Well, and it's all too easy for it's natural, right? Because Mm -hmm. It's, it's perspective, yep. but it's very, very easy 
for fans to look at a situation uh, or a particular recruitment and think that it all boils down to prestige or it all boils down to the name on the front of the jersey, the logo on the helmet. And for some kids, it does. Like, I remember just a couple of days ago, I posted an update on Ashton Sanders, just kind of letting people know, hey, Wisconsin's still in this thing. Like, yeah. this is this is not a slam dunk for Oklahoma. Wisconsin's still in this thing. And instantly, of course, the reaction is, how on earth could Oklahoma be in a – could even find themselves in a recruiting battle with Wisconsin of all schools? How is that even if, – if Oklahoma's truly a staff full of elite recruiters, how on earth – are they going toe to toe with a school like Wisconsin? Well, the answer is because Wisconsin has been recruiting Ashton Sanders a lot longer than Oklahoma has. And when he went up there, the way he phrased it to me, when he went up there on his Wisconsin official visit, he found brothers is what he said. He met players on that team. He met people around that program that he touches base with every single day. And so it's, <laughs> When you put yourself in the shoes of a prospect, and it's a lot easier said than done to do that in totality, but when you truly put yourself in the prospect's shoes, you start to have a lot more simple sympathy for what they're going through. And yeah, Brandon, look, I mean, I've met some really good dudes uh, that did not end up going to Oklahoma for one reason or another, but that uh, I still stay in touch with. Uh, to this day, uh, guys that are easy to root for. And, you know, when when you got a 17, 18-year-old kid just trying to figure their life out, really. And I know that kind of sounds dramatic, but that's what it is. Like, that's it's such a – it's a life-altering decision that you make whenever you choose where to go to college. Perfect example would be Jaden Rashada, right? I got real tight with Jaden. We, we would see each other at a lot of the same events over the course of the spring and <laughs> – we had a whole lot of conversations about recruiting because for the longest time, he just didn't know where he wanted to go. He wanted to go to Oklahoma. He said, I was going to come to Oklahoma and I was going to commit at the end of January. But then Jackson Arnold beat him to it. And then after that, he was never really sure where he wanted to end up. Last I talked to him in person was at overtime in Las Vegas. That was about a week before he committed to Miami. And at the time, he had no idea. He was like, man, I don't know. I might push this date back. I'm not really sure where home is. And obviously last night, <laughs> he ends up flipping from Miami to Florida, which just kind of illustrates the fact that there's so much that goes into a decision like that. And people's minds can change. Perspectives can change. Opinions can change. I remember <laughs> when I was deciding between colleges, Brandon, I... I <laughs> I didn't play college sports. There was much less involved in my decision than there is for yeah. the decision of a high profile college athlete. Right. And I struggled. Like, I went mm -hmm. all the way down to 24, 48 hours before the enrollment window closed before I finally decided which school I wanted to go to. But when you take into account all the relationships you have with coaches, your family situation, your peer relationships, and mm -hmm. that obviously came into play significantly for Colton Vosick in Texas, specifically the relationship with Arch Manning. There's so much that factors into a decision that ultimately impacts the initial arc of your adult life as a college student, as a college athlete, as a young man. And so it is very easy, all too easy for fans to look at a decision like that from a third party perspective and only see it for what's right in front of their faces and only see the very ostensible, very tangible factors at play. But generally when you're the one going through it, there's a lot more to it than that. And so yeah. is Colton Vosick the type of player that you would have loved to see in an Oklahoma uniform if you're a Cerna fan? Sure. And no doubt when, the Sooners go up against the Longhorns year in and year out over the next few years, there's going to be a little bit of an, there'll be an extra narrative there. there there'll be an added storyline, especially if Vosick's lining up opposite somebody like Heath Ozida or Caden Green, right? Yeah. But at the same time, I would, and, and, and there are some exceptions where 
kids burn bridges and they treat people wrong. But for the most part, it's not that hard. At least it shouldn't be that hard to just simply be okay with whatever decision a kid makes for their life and their future and wish them the best regardless of where they're going. And I, I hope most OU fans can come around to that with Colton Vosick. I feel like some already have, but obviously a flip from Oklahoma to Texas is not that common. Uh, it's not something you see every single cycle, and there's probably a bit of added vitriol there for some fans. But like you said, Brandon, he's a good kid. He had to make a tough decision, and – the mature thing to do is just to wish the kid the best and hope you beat him four times while he's in college. That's yeah. entirely fair. I think, I think that's probably the best way to go about it. I, there's a lot of kids that, I mean, look, those that don't remember Jamarcus McFarland's a prime example. Um, a kid that everybody thought was going to the university of Texas out of Lufkin. And next thing you know, he's signing with Oklahoma and playing for Oklahoma. And he, now he's a defensive line coach at TCU. Um, and he's one of the better defensive line coaches in the country. And then you have guys like um, – I mean, Casey Thompson. Everybody thought Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Oklahoma because his dad played at Oklahoma. His brother played at Oklahoma. Where he ends up? University of Texas. Adrian Peterson, Texas, 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 ends up at Oklahoma. So it it just happens. Like, it happens. And with Colton Vasek, I think, it, it again, it has a lot to do with, and I'm not saying the kid doesn't want to go to Texas, because I think ultimately there's a love there. He grew up big Texas fan, going there, season tickets with his parents, all that type of stuff. So – Obviously, there's deep rooted love there, but at the but there was something there with Oklahoma that drove him there, and ultimately, what drove him away was the play on the field, number one, and that can't be overlooked. If anybody wants to point the blame, the team needs to take the blame, the coaches need to take some of the blame because. They're the ones that crack the door open. If they're right now sitting seven and two, Colton Vasek's not going anywhere. I just don't see it. You know what I mean? Like you're still up for the Big 12 title. You're doing a lot of things. If 49 to nothing doesn't happen, you probably still have Colton Vasek. So there's there's a lot of variables that play into that. But that's not how it played out. He played out how it played out. Like, I mean, that's well, and he said it. He said he was watching them closely. He literally told people, I'm watching both schools and how they play this year. Yeah. Well, and I I forget who it was. I I would love to give them their proper credit, but for the life of me, I can't remember who I was having this conversation with. But I was having a conversation with somebody else uh on the OU beat. And what they mentioned to me was and their perspective on it, and I think it's a really good perspective, is, look, any other year, Colton Vosick's probably a Sooner. It yeah. just so happened that he's class of 2023, and this fall was the one year where the wheels kind of started to fall off for Oklahoma, and Texas was – I mean, you know, you look at Texas right now, they're 6-3. and three. I know, they're one game better. That's the but, weirdest part about it. But they were 5-7 and seven last year, so it seems so much bigger than what it really is. Which, again, if Colton Vosick is a class of 2022 prospect, he's a Sooner. Yeah. He's a Sooner. Um, it, it's just kind of the perfect storm of circumstances where you get a kid that happens to love Oklahoma but grew up a Texas legacy in Austin. And any other year over the past decade, Oklahoma is pretty demonstrably outperforming Texas on the gridiron. And that's probably enough to keep the kid committed over the course yep. of the fall. But in 2022, that's just not the case. So <laughs> you win some, you lose some. Here's here's a question. Okay. 
And I thought about it last night and I was like, you know, he keeps saying he, he said it from the start. It's how they finish. It's how they finish. So right now, Texas is six and three, but my God is their last three games tough. <laughs> they obviously have TCU at home this week. Then they have to go to Kansas. And I know that sounds super weird to say you got to go to Kansas, but Kansas is about to have seven wins. So this isn't your daddy's Kansas. It's not your grandpa's Kansas. This is 2007 Kansas. This is 2008, 2006 Kansas. Mark Mangino type Kansas teams before they decided they wanted to fire him and thought they were too good for him at that point and probably the dumbest move they've ever done Um, because he yelled at kids. Remember, he cursed at kids. That was the big deal. Um, If Texas loses three in a row and Oklahoma wins three in a row to end the season, does the Colton Vasek sweepstakes open back up? No. No. I I agree. I agree, but it's something that has to be said because the kids said, I'm watching how the teams close out. And if one team ends up six and six and the other one ends up eight and four, well, I think he – look, if if you paid attention to his flip announcement, he said the one thing that really needed to be said to ease everyone's mind about the I whole ordeal stay home. and make it clear. Well, no, it wasn't that. It was my heart has been in a different place. Mm-hmm. The kid's heart is in Texas. So – no, even if Oklahoma were to win their last three and Texas were to lose their last three, I don't think he reneges on his pledge at that point. I, I agree. Think he's home I agree, for good but it had to be questioned. Texas. It had to be yeah. questioned because the kids said the words. I'm watching how the two teams ended up after things started to go bad for Oklahoma, after Bedlam, or after uh, OU Texas. That's his exact words. So just a question. Um I think it'll be interesting. I do think Oklahoma would get an in-home at least at that point because things had turned around and one team would be fledging, the other team not. But I still think he would sign at Texas. I agree. I just, I can't see. that. It, it, it's harder to get away from Texas being an Austin Westlake kid because nobody has ever signed at the University of Oklahoma from Austin Westlake. There's been very few that have went to Texas A&M, as a matter of fact. Almost everybody exclusively from Austin Westlake goes to Texas. Now, Lake Travis is a whole other ball game. And as weird as it is, they're like, what are they, like six, seven miles apart? Yes. And very like close. six, seven miles of difference. You have Lake Travis, who's had Oklahoma people. They've had... uh Ohio State, a bunch of other places, right? But Austin Westlake, outside of Clemson and a few A&M, man, they're UT all the way. I, I don't know what it is about that school, but that's just how it's always been. Um, David Hicks is the other one everybody wants to talk about right now and Peyton Bowen, so we'll discuss those. We'll start with David Hicks and his teammate, Damian Sanford, four-star linebacker, best friend. And I'm going to say it, and you and I have talked about it all week. I talked to somebody close to David Hicks. Before he signed with a and and somebody else told me they had heard the same thing that was covering this, and they weren't even – It was, it was a national guy – who actually confirmed this to me as well. And he was one of the ones that was there. I'm not going to say who he worked for or anything like that. And I'm talking, so I'm talking to a national, I'm talking to somebody around David Hicks and I talked to a national guy that's really close to this, like real, real close to the situation. And I was told that Oklahoma NIL wise was way up there. And two people, one with that would be considered close to David Hicks and one national recruiting guy that is actually in the region and covering 
the David Hicks situation probably better than anybody that I know. Like he's just great. Um, outside of Steve Wiltfong, like those two would be like the two guys that have covered it the best with David Hicks. And this person goes, yeah, I think Oklahoma offered more than a and And that blew my mind and it blew your mind when we heard it. We were like, what? What is going on? And you know what they said? And I got blasted for saying this on our board. The deciding factor was Damian Sanford. They do everything together. They are best friends. So, and, and you want to know why that, that do you want to know why that's believable? Because everybody's offering his best friend now. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're taking visits together everywhere. Does, I mean, right? Like, it's now. Do you mean somewhat... to tell me, oh, you offered more than a and Brandon? I don't know that as a fact. I'm just yeah. saying they were up there. I, I don't, I don't. I'm just repeating what multiple people told me. And Have you some people say they the offer you is broke narrative. Yeah, it totally screws over the OU's broke narrative and the OU doesn't do NIL narrative. Um, there, there were rumors heading into it. You and I both heard that were pretty substantial amount of money that Oklahoma was throwing out there. And we don't know it as a fact. Right. Like we don't know it as a fact. And, but the package that AM put out there for him, coinciding with the fact that his best friend is committed there, was what I was told was the deciding factor at the end of the day. Like he just felt comfortable hanging out with his best friend. And that doesn't mean he's not close to people on the Oklahoma class because he's close with. Jackson Arnold, he's close with Petaway because Petaway's cousin plays, obviously, as a freshman defensive back for and a star. By the way, Oklahoma will offer that kid, his cousin, um, at Katie Paytel, 2025 DB. Um, he was close with Colton Vasek at the time. He's super close with Derek LeBlanc. Um, he's real, real close with Peyton Bowen. Like, and that's assuming Peyton Bowen chooses Oklahoma in the end. But the fact is, there is a lot of guys that he talks to on the Oklahoma, in the Oklahoma class. But those are distant friendships, right? Like, it's like people they're not hanging out with all the time. But then when you get to be at A&M, he would get to be roommates with his best friend, like his literal best friend. And I was told that was a huge, huge deciding point. And his dad even said something to me before the announcement, and I thought little of it. I remember trying to decide when all the A&M stuff started happening if I wanted to even go down there. And I'm on the phone with his dad, and his dad said, I would still pick Oklahoma, but... The thing is, <laughs> I chose University of Louisiana Monroe and then so South Al or Alabama State at a high school. I flipped. And it took me three or four years to get comfortable. I finally made it to, I think he ended up graduating from Southern, if that, I remember correctly. Is that right? He went to Southern, right? Southern, yes, yeah, you're right. Southern, right, yeah, before he went to the Kansas City Chiefs. And he said it took him three or four years to get comfortable in the locker room, and that's when he got to Southern because he knew everybody there. It was comfortable to him. And he said that's where he came out of his shell and played his best ball because he was comfortable with the locker room. He was comfortable with the surroundings. He was comfortable with everything. And at the end of the day, that's what he said, that's what David needs to decide. Where is he most comfortable at? And I didn't think anything of it at the time. I it, I it did cross my mind with Damian Sanford. It crossed my mind. But it wasn't enough that I thought much of it. And his dad even said along with it, those guys, he goes, and he goes, and he's got a buddy going to AM, and that's what's making it so hard because they do everything. They go to practice together, they hang out after practice at our house or at his house every day together. They go get lunch together. They are best friends. They do everything together. 
And I didn't think anything of it, Parker, at the time. Didn't think anything of it. Because the kid had been committed to Oklahoma for three months. He knew all those kids in that class. And I was like, he's really tight with Derek LeBlanc. That's got to be a big deal. Oh, was I wrong? Was I wrong? And then they walk in and say, he's going to A&M. Like 20 minutes before he announces, like, what? And that is what it is. But you throw the NIL package that A&M threw up, then I don't know that Oklahoma was as much as them. I don't know that. We don't know. I know Oklahoma threw a really good one out there. That's what we do know. We know that now. We didn't know that then. (laughs) We know it now. (laughs) And... But Sanford was the decision, and now Oregon offered, and they're going to take a visit to Oregon this weekend. And then they've got one to Bedlam next weekend together. Both taking officials. Well, one, uh, he's obviously going up with Sanford on his official with him. And so it'll be an unofficial for DJ Hicks, but official with Sanford, but he's going up to hang out with um his best friend in Oregon. And so I think it's going to be a matter of, do they feel more comfortable at A&M and everything that's going on there? Or do they feel more comfortable at Oregon or Oklahoma? Is the flight all the way up to, in the fact that you have to drive down an hour and a half from Portland to get to Eugene after all that? Is all that travel going to be something they, that weighs on their mind? Or is it or is it the fact that you just can go to Oklahoma City and be in Norman 15 minutes later after you get off the airport, or after you get out of the airport? Or is the drive to College Station, the 45 minutes an hour drive, is that going to be... Like all that or, you know, or the six-hour drive to Norman. Like there's so many things that are going to play into this thing, Parker, along with NIL. I mean, we're stupid if we don't say NIL is not going to play in this. I have a funny feeling Oklahoma and Oregon are going to play the NIL game here. Just a thought. Just a thought. It kind of of feels like there might never be another five-star recruitment again in which NIL doesn't come into play. But the weird thing is that in 2023, OU managed – to hit on two of the only five-star recruitments. I don't care. In which NIL did not matter at all. Jackson Arnold, PJ Adabare, neither mm-hmm. of those two guys ever – and look, they're going to get paid. Like, those guys are going to get NIL deals the second they yeah. show up on campus. But those were never – those those dudes were never going to make a decision that was even remotely based on – their nil valuation so oh you has has done a real nice job not only of picking out some real high grade talent but managing to find guys that aren't going to get distracted by the bag as it were and look there are going to be recruitments dj hicks and peyton mullen to provide two pertinent examples there are going to be recruitments like this one or like these ones where you have to play the game a little bit and Oklahoma's prepared to play the game. Doesn't mean they're always going to win the game, right? Because as we found out with Jane Rashada, especially, (laughs) you can play the game and you can throw a lot of money out there. And in some cases, it's just not enough. It wasn't for Miami. And so there'll be battles that Oklahoma wins. There'll be battles that Oklahoma loses. But they're a lot more prepared to play the game as it were in the sense of NIL. Mm-hmm. than many realize or acknowledge. Yeah. I mean, th- there is th- – everybody assumes – I, and I know NIL gets played out with big-time five stars, but if you sit there and you think NIL is what every kid cares about, no, oh, it's not. It really isn't. Like, I would say almost 70% of the recruits couldn't care less about the NIL, like it's, it, they, they think about it, but that isn't their ultimate deciding factor on where they go because there's so much more to the college experience 
And if you believe in yourself, and this is a lot, this is what a lot of coaches are going to sell on Parker is if you believe in yourself and the fact that we develop you, you're going to be making far more than you're ever going to make in an IL for much longer on the back end. If you actually come to our university, you're going to get money, but you're not, you're going to get enough money to live off of and be comfortable as an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old. And then as a 22 year old till the time you're 35, you could be making money that you've never dreamed of in the NFL if you come and play here or wherever they're deciding they're recruiting them to. You know, like, and, and that plays, right? Like, that plays with a lot of kids. Would you agree with that? I would. A lot of kids don't care about the upfront money because they think they're going to get far more when they get to the NFL. They're betting on themselves. I think that's an understated fact in this because everybody just kind of assumes, ah, oh, well, he was paid, you go there. And you and I could probably name 80% of the class that didn't make a dime hardly at all to go to Oklahoma, right? Like, yeah, they're just not. If people think that Jackson Arnold's not going to get anything, I think, or he hasn't, he doesn't have things set up, I think they're wildly misconstrued. Um. He doesn't care about it. He doesn't gloat about it. He doesn't talk about it. And that's not why he chose Oklahoma. He just so happened to have a lot of stuff start lining up for him after he committed. But it happened long after he committed. It was after he became the number one kid at the Elite 11 that everything started falling at him. Because <laughs> that's kind of where everybody was like, oh, you got to keep this kid. Let's figure out how. So, um, I mean, it's, it's a different breed. I, and then when you go with Peyton Bowen and IL does matter, it just does. And if you don't think Oklahoma's not going to play that game here, mm -mm -mm. yeah, they are much like DJ Hicks. They're going to play the game now to how far and to what extent. We don't know yet, but his girlfriend is going to Oklahoma. His mom and dad and his brother live two hours, an hour and a half away from Norman. There is going to be a line that is going to be drawn between him and Oklahoma, and the number is going to be written on a piece of paper somehow, some way, to whoever is going to be helping out with the NIL or whatever, however things are set up. I don't know how all that stuff works, honestly. And as much as he loves Oklahoma, as much as he wants to be a Sooner, or at least portrays that, and how many time he visit times he visits OU, what has he been four games now? He's been what does he miss? One home game this year. Yes, one home game. He's missed one home game. I think it was the, it was the first game of the year, right? He missed the first game of the year, and that was it, right? Was he and here he this made... past weekend? No, he missed two then. He's missed okay, two. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So he's missed two home games. That's it. He's been to every other one. The whole follow the visits thing kind of works here. But then at the same time, is Oklahoma going to throw? And I'm not saying the university. I'm just saying is the NIL collective going to throw six, six figures at him? Are they going to throw... Like, what are they going to throw at Peyton Bowen? We don't know. So I, I think that will be the ultimate deciding factor because we know that Notre Dame has a package for him. We know that A&M has a package for him. What will be Oklahoma's package for Peyton Bowen? And if he signs with Oklahoma, you know that's good enough. I don't think it has to be a lot. I don't. I just think that it has to be – Enough. Competitive. Yeah, competitive. Um, And man, he would be a huge get. He'd be a huge get. If you haven't watched the kid play in person, or at least if you haven't watched his tape, I mean, go watch Peyton Bowen's tape because, you know, Brent Venables made a comment earlier this week in his Tuesday press conference where he said, look, I don't care how big a dude is, and I'm paraphrasing here, but 
he essentially said, look, I don't care how big a dude is. Um, if he uh -huh. runs the fire, if he, if he flies to the ball, that's a dude that we want here. And he said, there's a kid I'm recruiting right now mm -hmm. that certainly fits that bill. And obviously as a coach, you can't, you can't name names. You can't get too specific when discussing recruiting in an environment like that, uh, in, a, in a forum like that. But you and I were texting back and forth and we both had the, had kind of the same thought. Brent Venables is talking about Peyton Bowen because mm -hmm. he's not a big dude. Mm -hmm. He's not huge, but man, he is an enforcer. Yeah, he hits he, hard. He's he flies horse. around. He's a ball hawk. He's dynamic in the return game. That's a true five star. When when you show up to watch a Denton guy or football game, it's not difficult to pick out which two kids on the field are the five stars. Right? It's Jackson Arnold and it's Peyton Bowen, and it's pretty blatantly evident to everybody who's watching. But man. This would be massive for Oklahoma because, and this is something that we've talked about in past podcasts, if there's been one consistent common denominator among Oklahoma's defensive struggles over the last 10 years, it's been the secondary. The secondary has consistently been a bugaboo for this program. And it kind of feels like the only way that's going to change is if you truly get some dogs in the back end. And the Sooners already got a few committed, most notably Macari Vickers, who I think is a guy that's going to push for playing time immediately when he shows up. But you had Peyton Bowen to the fold, and you throw in another couple guys and Jacoby Johnson, uh, Josiah Wagner, Eric McCarty, who all have very high ceilings of their own. This mm -hmm. has the potential to be a defining class for Oklahoma as far as the secondary is concerned specifically. I think it's already a great class. You add Peyton Bowen and you're able to push it over the top with the addition of a kid like that, it becomes an elite class. And yep. when you can bring in an elite class at a position group that has lacked true difference makers like those for so long, mm -hmm. it's where you really start to believe that, to borrow an analogy from one of our favorites, the worm is going to turn. Yeah eventually yeah do you i know that i'm the one that covers peyton a little more but how much do you think you and i will play in this i mean i've told you things but... well well yeah, yeah 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 look look again as you mentioned anybody who says nil is not a factor is naive because it mm -hmm. is but at the same time I think you put it well when you said, as long as the offer is competitive, it's not something that the two sides are probably going to do a whole lot of hemming and hawing over because Peyton mm -hmm. Bowen's best friend is committed to Oklahoma. Peyton Bowen's girlfriend is signed to play soccer at the University of Oklahoma. Oklahoma has a lot of those little ancillary factors working in their favor. So yeah, as long as the offer is competitive, you feel good. Oklahoma is DJ Hicks, is Texas A&M the DJ Hicks scenario with Peyton Bowen? best friend, girlfriend, comfortability, knowing everybody up there. I mean, you want to know what else plays big with him and has gotten – this person's gotten to know him really well over the last three months or so. They weren't really that acquainted, and it's really odd to know to, to hear this. They weren't that acquainted before this because they went to two different schools in Denton. But this person has become a big player. Because oh. it's, it's the same scenario, number one. It is. Same scenario, number two. It's it's the fact that they play a similar position. They play the same. They're both very similar in body type, very similar in the way they play. They both were just freaks coming out of high school and superstars could play offense, could play defense, could do anything, can punt return, kick return. They can do it all when healthy. Yeah, we, we've talked about how many And they all both have the last parallels. name with B and Bo in it. Yeah, they also both have the girlfriend factor. They have the girlfriend. That's what I'm saying. It's the exact same situation. Well, Billy yeah. Bowman plays large in this, large in this. They have gotten acquainted over – ever since week one – 
uh, Billy Bowman had started to build a rapport with Peyton Bowen and two Dentonites. Um, both have girlfriends that play for programs. I think the soccer girls, are they undefeated this year? At one point they were six and zero. did they end up going undefeated? Do we know that? I don't, I don't think so. But they, they ended up winning a lot of games this year. Um, they're both really good athletes. Their girlfriends, they're good athletes. Um, so, so many similarities between both of them, uh, both highly, highly ranked guys. Obviously, Billy Bowman was a top 45 kid in the country, almost a five star. Peyton Bowen is a five star. They're just a spitting image of each other, really. And how Billy Bowman has blossomed at Oklahoma to become one of, if not the best safety in the Big 12. That's weird to say. How bad Oklahoma's defense is, the one person that you can sit there and say, this guy is the best at his position in the Big 12 is Billy Bowman. The one guy that hadn't played a whole heck of a lot at safety heading into the year either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, has he's just that. a special athlete. Yeah. He's just a special football player. And Peyton Bowen has the same potential. And mm -hmm. I think what what makes you even all the more confident in Peyton Bowen is that, I, as I kind of touched on right there, he's far more acquainted with the position than Billy Bowman was. <laughs> um, I'm laughing because I just got a text. You, you saw the by Job thing on our board today, right? Which by Job thing? There's always a new the one. The one where the guy said, "My girl, his girlfriend told me, that he got NIL, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. My job doesn't have a girlfriend. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm laughing that hey, I'm getting a text maybe message. It's, maybe it's one of those, maybe, maybe it's a secret girlfriend, Brandon. Maybe it's one that the family doesn't know about. Maybe it's one that the coaches don't know about. No, I don't Who think knows? this person, this, this person... <laughs> Posted something last night. I'm not going to name who they are, so I don't want to call them out specifically. This person posted something saying, like, I talked to his girlfriend, and his girl told me specifically it was for an aisle. You can meet her. This person had no idea or at least hasn't paid attention to the board that I was the one that found by Job. I'm around CCS all the time. I know the coach. I know his trainer. I know his parents. Bye and I talk constantly, and I've never once heard of a girl. And I didn't throw the girl out. I was like, he's like, or you could just ask her to her face, come out to Holdenville, knowing I'm not going to go out there to Holdenville because I'm going Holdenville? to Holdenville. Yes. The girl's in Holdenville. No, no, no. He's like, you can, she can tell you to her face. I would love to meet you and tell you to your face. And I was like, bro, you know, I got, I didn't say that on the board yet because I didn't want to call the guy out, but I was like, I can just call the, call these people and ask them what's up. And so I text somebody that would know that goes to every visit with them that you know that I know and you know this person very well. Yes. And I said, has Bai got a girlfriend recently? And he goes, no. <laughs> He's focused on football. And I was like, okay, just checking, you know, just making sure here that I'm not off on this. Um, Weird deal, man. Like people... We'll say some weird things on the board. I'm not going to lie to you. That's why you all should sign up. It's quite the entertainment value if you like craziness. And it's Twitter, but with inside information all the time. Right? Right. Right. Um, so you talked about Ashton Sanders earlier. He's taking an official visit. Oklahoma, he's one of the new recent offers. Uh, we both have talked to him quite a bit, and there's a reason why I haven't put in a crystal ball for him yet. Yeah, likewise. And it's Wisconsin. Like I, the, that was the literally the first thing he said to me was, "I'm going to take an official visit to Wisconsin." Now, when I talked to Greg Biggins, Biggins and I both, he can, he's already taken one, but he can if the with the new staff he can take another. So, yes, he can. um. That's just that's an NCAA rule. You can take another one when they hire a new coach. Um, now, 
I think all three of us, you, myself, and Greg Biggins believe that after he gets to Norman and he visits there in Bedlam, that that Wisconsin visit probably doesn't take place. But the Oklahoma visit has to happen first. And it has yeah. to go well first. We well, assume it's going to go well enough that that's going to take place. And the reason why there's so much that hangs in the balance here is because, you know, you talk about Wisconsin and at face value, Wisconsin doesn't really feel any, you, you start to understand, right? Why there are so many fans on the message board saying, how is Oklahoma in a recruiting battle with Wisconsin? Because you think about the blue blood programs in college football, you think about the perennial contenders, Wisconsin's not far off that list, but they're solidly in the second tier. But at the same time, they do have one of the best defensive minds in the country in Jim Leonard as their interim head coach at the moment. And all signs point toward him being the permanent guy at Wisconsin at season's end. Mm -hmm. And you're not, it's not as if you're going up against a scrub on the recruiting trail or in coaching circles. Jim Leonard knows what he's doing. He's very well respected. He's very young too. And that comes into play because as a Wisconsin alum, as a guy that has already uh, cut his teeth and made his hay in the coaching profession as early in the process as he has, you can count on some degree of stability there. You can mm -hmm. count on Wisconsin being the destination job for him. Mm -hmm. And so Wisconsin can make a lot of the same overtures that Oklahoma can. And of course, Oklahoma can sell a few things that Wisconsin can like prestige, like championships, but as far as play on the field in 2022, the discrepancy is not that big between Wisconsin and Oklahoma, if there is a discrepancy at all. So no, this will be a battle for Ashton Sanders. And yeah, I think you give the edge to Oklahoma just because you trust the staff, but um Oklahoma's not out of the woods by any means. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think that, you know, he's, like you said, the Jim Leonard stuff is just, it's a lot to, it's a lot to take in being the fact that, and I think there's something Oklahoma fans also need to wrap their head around. Jim Leonard and Jay Valai are best friends. They played together at Wisconsin. They're super, super, super close. I know that for a fact. And if Wisconsin came calling, I think it would be very hard for Jay Valai to turn down, especially if he gets the D.C. job at Wisconsin. I think it would be impossible for him to turn down. And if that was the case, you know who I'd go get if I'm Oklahoma? In a heartbeat, and I know for a fact that this person would – I'm not going to say move, but they would more than listen. TJ Rushing. Mm, Paul's Valley Zone. Mm -hmm. Paul's Valley Zone, A&M's cornerback coach, so you know he can recruit his tail off. Um, DB coach. And he would fit the culture at Oklahoma, too, just from a personality standpoint. So... Yeah, I, I honestly, there's a lot of things to watch there with the Wisconsin scenario because it could, it could put a dent in Oklahoma's defensive staffing. Now, I'm not saying that it will, because he's getting paid, Jay Valai is getting paid a substantial amount of money. That, I mean, I think he's making what seven hundred thousand, something like that, right? Yeah, I don't know exactly. But it's, it's something it's, like it's, it's up there. It's in that range. I don't know that Wisconsin is going to pay that even for DC. Like, I just don't like, I don't know that they have that type of money in their athletic department to pay that. Like that's something Remember, Oklahoma's broke and yet they're paying their coordinators and, and, and position coaches almost a million dollars. So, but they're broke. Um, yeah, I, but it is something to watch just because of the closeness there. Um, another offer that is out there is 2023 right now, three star defensive end out of Nolensville, Tennessee, Taylor wine. Um, Talk about blowing up. 
Yeah, USC, hmm. Virginia Tech, Ole Miss. Missouri. Uh, Missouri just offered him right before we started the podcast. And he is going to remind a lot. I, I, look, you hear the three-star Oklahoma fans, you're like, oh, God, here we go. Three-star Yale. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know that's what it sounds like, right? That's what I how I read it when I say that. It just yeah. sounds like a whiny little you know what. Um, but this kid is going to skyrocket up the rankings. Go watch his film. If he was in the state of Texas or Georgia or Florida or California or even in the DMV or Ohio or something like that, this kid would be ranked a four star already. Already. On top of that, he's got a wide receiver that Oklahoma's been recruiting, hasn't offered yet, and Chance Fitzgerald, a uh, teammate. But Taylor Wine is originally from Edmond, Oklahoma. I haven't reported that. It was the first time he and I spoke, he talked about, I love Oklahoma. I've been there a lot. I've got so much family there. And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 what? And he goes, yeah, I grew up in, I grew up in Edmond. Wait, what? And he was like, yeah, my family, they all went to OU or UCO or places like that. And I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What? And he's like, yeah, we just moved out here to the Nashville area, blah, blah, blah. This kid's a stud. An absolute stud. And he is built like he's a taller version of Colton Vasek. He weighs more than Colton Vasek. And he moves like him. I'm not saying he's as good as Colton Vasek because Colton Vasek is far more refined than Taylor Wine. His dad was a star DN. His dad was a coach. His dad is his coach. Colton Vasek was going to come in and be able to play right off the bat because of how refined he was and how technical he was at everything. Like, he's going to be a star. Hate to break it to y'all, he's going to be a star. But Taylor Wine has that chance. His upside is huge. Huge. And you go back to the Ashton Sanders stuff, and there's a lot of people in Norman that believe he may be the best nose tackle in the country. And the first thing people are going to ask is, okay, well, why didn't they offer him to start with then? Fair question. Because I asked the same thing. You know what I was told? What's that? I already had a connection with Caden McDonald, and he has all those connections to Norman in Oklahoma. So it made sense to go after him with the relationship and the connections and all that stuff already, instead of going after and trying to build something out in California that wasn't already there. Now they're swinging at it and they may end up getting pretty lucky there, but the upside of Ashton Sanders is huge. You look at how he's built. The, the kid could weigh, put on another 30 pounds and still look slender. Like he is built like a, a beast. Yeah, he's beast. only about 270 right now. Yeah. People don't realize that either. And he's 6'4", and he's just, like, yoked. Yeah, he's like, only, he's, he's way six bigger one. than... Huh? He's only 6'2", 6'3", right? No, he's taller than... He's tall, He's listed at 6'3", on our board, right? On our stuff, right? So I, I asked him on the phone. I was like... Okay, so he's listed so way taller than... He, okay. Yeah. That's yeah, fair. So I, he said, he said, I'm six one two seven, which at least like he's honest about it. Most guys yeah. are like, they'll add two inches and they'll add 20 pounds. But he was just like, no, I'm about six one two seventy. But dang, okay. Dude, they have him listed like six three two ninety on our on our site. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Whatever. He's taller than Caden McDonald. Because Caden Mc, you and I have you stood next to Caden McDonald before? I don't think so. You and I are taller than him. Um okay. Yeah. Um, we're not short, folks. You get for those that haven't seen us person, we're by far from short. <laughs> so <laughs> um uh we're both over six foot. So um point being is that he's a he's a bigger vert. He looks bigger, he looks taller. I think because he's so he's just built longer, I guess. Like his arms are long. He's just built differently than Caden McDonald. And I think Caden McDonald's a really good player and gonna be a really good player in college. But I think Ashton Sanders has a ridiculous upside, and so do a lot of people in Norman. They think his upside is just out of this world. So they're very high on him and feel very good about their situation there. Um, 
as far as Taylor Wine goes, man, if Oklahoma doesn't end up with him, it's going to be crazy. He's coming for an unofficial. Right now, it's an unofficial to Oklahoma for the Bedlam game. He said they want to talk to Coach Chavis and Coach Venables about a potential official. But here's the problem Oklahoma's running into right now, folks. And they don't have the numbers for that crap. Mm-hmm. I think they've used 40 of the 56, 41 of the 56, something like that. So they got like 15 or 16 officials left. You throw Sanford, you throw Ashton Sanders, you throw Hicks, potentially Peyton Bowen. There's four. Um, and you got commits that still haven't taken theirs either. Right. And I don't think some of them aren't going, they're going to wait. Now that's where they're going to get around this. So as weird as this may sound, there's going to be some commits that take officials while they're in Norman already during the spring. So like a Heath Ozida, like a, um, um, uh, maybe a Eric McCarty. Like, I don't know. Like, this is like, I think an Eric McCarty, I think. It, and if they do take it, it'll be in December. I think most likely both of those. Um, I don't know how they're going to do all this because they've got to have some ready for transfers too. So like, if I'm in, If I'm an Eric McCarty, maybe I wait till December to take it. I know that would still go against, but at least you would have Oklahoma would have a better feel for their numbers at that point. Like how how are they gonna do all that? Because you gotta do Ozida, you gotta do McCarty, you gotta do I think Josiah Wagner, has he come on his official yet? No, he hasn't. So that's three. Who else has it? So Ozida, McCarty, Wagner, Keon Brown, I don't think has taken his official. Four. Um, has Jackson Arnold taken his? Yeah, he took it in June. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I guess that's probably about it. So you got four, and then you got four, vi- you got four taken officials this week. So that's eight out of 16. Now you have just eight left. And you got to save some for transfers. Well, that's it. That's the trans. That's it. And 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 then if you got a Peyton Bowen, now you got seven left. If Wine decides to take it, now you've got six left. <laughs> and that's it for transfers. Getting tight. So if you're Oklahoma, you try to talk everybody into waiting till the spring. If I'm them, I know they'll already be on campus, but you take the official in the spring. It can go against next year's class but it would be four against next year's class and i think they're willing to do that because i think they're going to be more picky about who takes officials and when they take them compared to this year just a bet this staff is learning like venables is learning on the fly as hard as that is man as hard as that is um all right let's uh let's talk about this game we're going to Morgantown. Yeah. You've never been, have you? I never have. Never even been to the state of West Virginia or Pennsylvania for that matter. I get to cross two new states off the list this weekend. <laughs> well, it's going to be, be cold. Mountainy and tree, and it's going to be cold. Yeah. And it's supposed to be raining, right? I hope not. No, I think it is supposed to be raining. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, pretty positive it's supposed to be raining. So, uh, yeah, it's gonna suck. But I think the I think the rain actually works in Oklahoma's favor, just because they're a very, um, yeah, one p.m. on Saturday, almost seventy percent chance of rain, forty nine degrees. Two p.m. sixty percent, three p.m. forty nine percent. But the good news is after the game, the rain goes away. <laughs> I'm going to be miserable. 
Yeah. I'm sure you want to go on that. You just want to cover it from, from home. Sounds pretty good right now, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, you know what? So, you know what would sound nice is uh, they have they have these at some state. I think they had them in Nebraska. You have like little field level suites that are climate controlled that are literally like right up on the end zone. It's yeah. nice to have like a little little well down there to shoot from and never move. <laughs> yeah, never have to move. I'm just going to stay right to here work. the whole game. I didn't know. I don't know what's going on because the Jumbotron's above me, behind me, but go team. <laughs> no. Well, uh, it'll yeah, be I, like, what do you think? What do you think uh, of the game as a whole? Because I think if you're Oklahoma and you can establish the run and really just beat down. West, now, West Virginia's got a good defensive line, I will say that, like with Steels yeah. and all those guys. But if you can beat down their defense with the run, with Eric Gray, I don't know if – I haven't asked if Javante Barnes is healthy this week or not. Have you? Uh, I, I, I haven't – received definitive word on whether he's traveling or not one thing i am very curious to see is uh, west virginia as we know they've got graham harrell's the offensive coordinator gonna put the ball in the air a lot it's more of that air raid scheme jt daniels the trigger man Jaden davis is not making this trip and so you would expect that cj colton is going to get his first career start uh, and you're probably probably going to see a lot more Gentry Williams as well in relief of either Colden or Woody Washington. But Colden's a guy that has very quietly played very well for Oklahoma over the course la- over the course of last month or so. And so this is an opportunity for him to prove he belongs in that lineup. I think he does, man. I've been super impressed with Colden. Um, he's certainly earned the snaps that he's gotten. Uh, he's legitimately pushed his way onto the field because he was not playing a whole heck of a lot to start the year, was kind of buried down the depth chart, even as a sixth year senior, and has really, really come on strong. So it's going to be pivotal that he is prepared for the moment uh, against a West Virginia team that's going to try to primarily beat you through the air. I mean, if this team manhandles you in the trenches and continually kicks you in the teeth with the run, mm-hmm. I just, I'm over it at that point, Brandon. <laughs> at that point, it's like just pack it in and forge ahead to 2023. Because I, if, if this isn't the type of team that you can't stop, as far as run defense goes, if this isn't a team that you can control at the point of attack, then I don't know, I don't know who you will. And so, yeah, but I mean, they gave, they gave, look, they put 43 up on Baylor. They put 31 up on TCU. They're not going to be a pushover. If Oklahoma fans think, like, I know Oklahoma fans are nervous. No, no, especially at home. And we're not trying to make them play, play way better at home than they do on the road. Way better. Because they put 43 up on Baylor and the very next week got pummeled by tech. Like, they're, they're, they're Jekyll and Hyde. And this Oklahoma team needs to show up and they need to show out. Because if they don't, there's going to be a problem. Now, I think the question is going to be is the crowd, right? Like, is the crowd going to be a normal Morgantown crowd? Because Morgantown crowds are normally ruthless and vibrant and loud and obnoxious and rude. And I don't know that that's – I don't know if that's going to take place or not. I'm not going to say it's not definitively. But Neil Brown's on his last leg. He needs to win the last three games of the year to keep his job or at least have a case to keep his job. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, Obviously, uh, the running back, uh, oh, my gosh, his name. I think he's out for the year for West Virginia. Donaldson, right, is his name? Donaldson, yes. Yes. And I think he's out for the year. Pretty sure. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure. No, he's out you're correct. You're correct. He's out for the year. Yeah. Um. So, but they are getting a couple of pieces back on the defensive side of the ball. I think a cornerback is coming back. Get a couple of defensive linemen back. Um. 
it's not going to be easy for Oklahoma to go up there and win. Now, they could go up and be Iowa State version Oklahoma and just dominate, or they could go up there and be Baylor version Oklahoma and play really well for a portion of the game and then just play absolutely atrocious the rest of the game. Talk about Jekyll and Hyde. Oklahoma's defense has been Jekyll and Hyde all year. It's been hard to watch. Hard to watch. And and there's been a lot more Hyde than Jekyll. Absolutely. 100% agree with that. Um, So, I know I asked you on Tuesday or Wednesday night, Friday morning, recording this podcast, where do you see this thing going now? 38-31. In favor of the sticking with it, still sticking with it. Yeah, I'll stand by. I mean, West Virginia is going to score. They're going to score. You're going to have to outscore them. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to go forty-two thirty-five Oklahoma. Yeah, I just don't know that Oklahoma's defense is going to. And I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope this defense shows up and is pissed and ready to play for the first time in a few weeks. Um, I think another guy people need to watch for is Key Lawrence. I don't know what his issue is 100%, but I know that RSJ has been getting quite a bit look at safety lately, so we'll see. Now, I expect Key to be there and play, but I don't know if he's going to start. Like, I don't know that. Because I know he was banged up a little bit this week. So. Um, I'm I'm wondering when the, when we're going to get the, the early season version of Marcus Major back. Yeah, that guy hasn't, that guy hasn't shown up in conference play. Mm-mm. Since he hurt his ankle. Yeah. It's been yeah. a little different. Um, what do you think of Dylan Gabriel this week? Does he redeem himself from last week's three interception game? I, I don't know if he really needs to redeem himself because look, in the eyes of the fans, of, he does. Yeah, but in the eyes of the fans, it's never enough. I know whatever Dylan Gabriel does, it's never enough because these people are used to having a superhero at quarterback and. Dylan Gabriel's a good quarterback. He's a really good quarterback, I would say, but he's not a superhero. Um, no. He's not going to – the difference between Dylan Gabriel and the quarterbacks that the Sooners – that Sooner fans are accustomed to watching is Dylan Gabriel isn't about to go and win you a 59-56 to 56 game in Morgantown this week in the way that mm-hmm. Kyler Murray did in 2018. It's just not realistic. We're Landry. You have to play a little bit better all that. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so – um. You look back at last week's performance from Gabriel. He missed a couple throws. He typically does. Um, One of those throws resulted in an interception. That was, I would say, the first interception of the year that Gabriel threw that was 100% on him. Think about the one he threw against Kansas. Marvin Mims broke, broke off the route. The first two against Baylor couldn't really help those. One was deflected into the air at the line of scrimmage, and the, the other was a blatant missed P.I. call on a ball that Jeff Levy called an incredible ball by Dylan Gabriel. So he made his first real mistake through the air last week against Baylor. But there was also a lot of good intermingled with the bad. Uh, he's shown himself to be pretty stable in some hostile road environments this year performed well at Iowa State, performed well against Nebraska. Obviously, TCU was a little iffy until he exited with the concussion. But I think as long as Dylan Gabriel shows up and gives Oklahoma a Dylan Gabriel-esque day, which is 275, 300 yards through the air, a couple touchdowns, and you win the turnover battle. I think that's enough to win the game. Yeah. I think winning the turnover battle in particular is huge because if you want to, if you really want to nitpick it, 
Oklahoma did lose the turnover battle to Baylor last week, and it didn't really feel like it. it. Didn't really feel like that was a game where Oklahoma lost the turnover battle. Like you didn't walk away from that game going, "Oh boy, if not if not for those turnovers." Um, and maybe that's just my perception, but it felt like there was a lot in that game uh, that didn't go the Sooners' direction, or it, rather, there was a lot in that game that contributed to the losing effort. But if you win the turnover battle on the road and you're able to keep the ball out of harm's way against a team like West Virginia, and you don't give them the opportunity to start to gather some momentum in front of that rowdy Milan Pushker stadium home crowd, mm -hmm. then I think you feel pretty good about your odds to go up to West Virginia and come away with the victory. Yeah. Uh, so as far as, DG's concern. You know, I was I was talking to somebody, and I think I talked to you about this as well. It like the awake how we you know DG's not a he's not a Superman. Like he's not going to do a lot of things that, and I know people hate to hear this. Caleb Williams, like. You see what Caleb Williams is doing for USC. How bad their defense is, right? But he masks everything for him because he can go and put up 50 if he has to. And he can run the ball. And when you need a fourth down and three, you just hike it to the 225-pound quarterback and let him run forward, right? Like, it's it's totally different than what Oklahoma has now. Like, he, he just masks a lot of problems that USC has defensively or USC and Riley are looking at the same problems Oklahoma has right now. And I say that because as much as Oklahoma fans would love to have Caleb Williams still in Norman, potentially, I think having Dylan Gabriel here is the best thing long-term because it wakes you up as a program. Across the board, bro. The donors are paying attention. They know they have to start doing things to help in the NIL and the facilities, right? The coaches understand that that the you can't just hinge on the offense and the defense has got to be built up to what it needs to be and developed into what it needs to be long term, right? Like you can't just be like, oh, well, we're nine and one. So whoop de do. Got a chance to make the playoffs. We can keep keep on keeping on. Just go get another Caleb Williams with the Jackson Arnold and just keep on keeping on. So as good as Dylan Gabriel is, and he's really good, you don't have Dylan Gabriel right now. This team is far worse off. That's assuming Caleb Williams is gone too. But... Dylan Gabriel allows you to, he's going to put points, he's going to put enough points up on the board that you should win the ball game. He's not going to put 50 or 60 up in a shootout. He's just not. Because he doesn't have the legs for it. The legs are the difference in this whole thing. He's not a power runner. He's not going to go get you 30 yards on a third and 20. You know what I mean? Like, Things that we've seen, Jalen Hurts, Kyler Murray, even Baker, Caleb, we've seen all those guys do that, right? We've seen them do that because they're bigger, faster, stronger guys. Superman's not there, like you said, Parker. He's not there. No. I don't know that even Batman, I would say Batman's there right now. Is that a fair comparison? Like. He's human with a couple of gadgets, and he's real smart. He's a smart guy. He plays smart. Sure. Sure, that's so, fair. I mean, it's – it is what it is, and the fans got to get – they have to understand that. Now, their Superman seems to be coming up in 2023, but he's a Denton guy right now. And he probably won't start as a freshman. And if he does, it'll be a lot like the Caleb Williams situation – where 
maybe somebody gets dinged up or, or maybe a Jason White situation where somebody gets dinged up and comes in and saves the day. And the rest is history. But I can't see him beating out. Like, you and I have talked to people around the program. They expect Dylan Gabriel to come back, and they, they don't think – they think that Jackson will sit behind him to start, right? You've heard the same thing I have. Because they don't want to just bring him along just to bring him along. Yeah. But Dylan Gabriel is good enough to win – eight, nine, 10 games a year, even play for a big 12 title, maybe 11, 12 games. Like he's good enough. The defense has to do their part. They don't have to be great. They just can't be atrocious. Like they've been. That's the difference. So, but yeah. Um, who do you think will be the player of the game offensively and defensively real quick? Who offensively. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to steal your thunder on the offensive side. So, I'll leave that one for you because I know I know who you're going to pick. Um, you do. I'll say. I'll, yeah, yeah. No, I do. Is it? I do. Okay, I think you probably do know because I've been touting him all week. Okay, go. Exactly. No. Uh, I'll say. I'll say Eric Gray. I'll say you get another big day from Eric Gray on the ground. Uh, another hundred yard afternoon, another couple touchdowns and continue to see him make his case for all big 12 first team honors defensively, man. Like I said, I think his performance is crucial. I think he's kind of the X factor defensively. Give me CJ Colden. Um, okay. I think West Virginia and JT Daniels going to put the ball in the air a lot. That's my expectation. Uh, they're probably going to have to, if they want to stay in this game, uh, and especially try to build an early lead and put themselves in a position to try and close this thing out down the stretch. But uh, I've been really impressed with what I've seen from Colton over the last few games. And now that he gets a chance to inherit that expanded role with Jaden Davis out, um, I think he responds and responds in a big way. And so I'll say he is your defensive MVP. Not to go Jalil Farouk. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Marvin Mims is going to have a huge day. I, I, I do. I think he's going to be big. I think I think Eric Gray is too. But I just think they're 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 starting to get the ball in Jalil Farouk's hands in so many different ways. They're realizing. I think they knew it all along. I just think it was the 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 progression of the the offense. And I was looking at his stats. This I think he has four hundred and something yards from scrimmage this year four touchdowns like he's he's gonna be good man <laughs> he's gonna be good he has a chance to be wide receiver one uh when mims leaves and i don't know that mims will leave after this year uh i was talking to somebody and i think he needs a third round grade. he needs to be guaranteed third round pick for him to decide to leave and i don't know that that's guaranteed right now um even with the stellar year that he has i just think he could use one more year of putting together what he's doing this year because last year was just such a – he's been up and down, and it wasn't his fault. It was yeah. the offense's fault last year. But uh, it, it might work in Oklahoma's hands to get him back again for 2023, and that would be huge for OU. But Jalil Farouk has a chance to be that dude, man. He's fast, big, athletic. You can get him in the run game. You can get him in the passing game. Uh, and I think he surprises some people and has a big game on Saturday. Uh, defensively, I'll go with the easy one, Billy Bowman. Billy Bowman. He changes the defense in the secondary. The secondary has played well for two weeks in a row. They were not the problem last week. The front seven was the problem. And if the front seven can get a little bit more pass rush. Just a little bit more. They're not very good at it, but they just need a little bit more. Instead of just one sack a game, they need to have far more than that. I think that uh, they have a chance to, or he has a chance to do some really special things during game Saturday, especially if it's going to be raining. That means the ball is going to be slippery. It could slip out of uh, JT Daniels' hands. Could sell on him a little bit. That makes that's usually where the safeties come in on those type of plays. So we'll see. Um, I'll go with I'll go with Billy Bowman. I know he's got that big knee brace on. 
and I don't expect it to come off until bowl season. So we'll see. Um, I think the four that we picked outside of not saying Marvin Mims or DG were probably the, the guys that everybody would pick for players of the, the game. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you're not subscribed on the YouTube, please do. We're almost to 8,000 subscribers on our OU Insider. What is it? OU at 247 Sports? OU Insider, OU Insider at- on 24-7 Sports. On 24-7 Sports. OU Insider on 24-7 Sports is our YouTube. Uh, just go search it. Just go like, subscribe. There's new stuff up all the time, almost every day, if not every day, uh, as far as videos go regarding Oklahoma recruiting, regarding Oklahoma football team, and then it's going to transition over to basketball and softball as the winter and spring moves along as well before it gets back into football spring. So uh, there's going to be a ton of content constantly on there. Um, If you're not subscribed to OUinsider.com, VIP, you should. It's $1 for the first month, $9.95 afterwards. $1 gives you the try. If you don't want to, don't like us, you don't like us. It would get you through National Signing Day, I'm just saying. Um, Or you can do 30% off right now. Uh, $75 gets you a whole year of OU Insider and all of 24-7 Sports, every single VIP site on 24-7 Sports. And there's over 200, and I think there's around 250 total. So it's huge. It's a big, vast variety of sites that you can go peruse and see what's going on with the A&M, USC, whoever that Oklahoma is going up against on the recruiting trail, or if they're going up against the West Virginia, you can go see their VIP site, see what they're saying about Oklahoma. You can go do all of that if you're on OU Insider VIP and you're signed up annually. After the first year of OU Insider annually, you get Paramount Plus, but it takes one year, and that means you'll get uh, 1883, 1931, Tulsa Kings, um, all sorts of great movies. There's over 2,000 movies from Paramount. Uh, you get Viacom, anything that's owned by Viacom, whether CBS Sports, Comedy Central, whatever, you can stream it right there on Paramount+. Plus. But that's after the first year that you're with us. So it's worth it. It's a two-for-one deal after the first year on OU Insider. All right. For Parker Thune, my name is Brandon Drum. You guys have a blessed day. We will see you on the post-game podcast.